following program is exclusively produced and distributed by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc., all rights reserved. Hi, Golden Age film fanatics, and welcome to DVD Classics Corner on the Air. My name is Dick Dinman, and our goal is to become your exclusive guide to the very best of the Golden Age classics coming out on DVD. We'll have reviews, breaking news of upcoming releases, plenty of surprise guests, and a special feature devoted to the great Golden Age film composers, which we call Cine Music. So let's turn on the marquee and lights, camera, action. It's time for Dick's Picks, in which I get to shine the spotlight on one of my Dick's Picks of the week. They are rugged pioneers, Indian fighters, and brave trailblazers who tame the Wild West. These are the women of the great frontier. That's right, the women who predominate in the cast of one of the greatest Western epics ever made. William A. Wellman's Westward the Women, which is based on actual historical record. This wagon train saga details a 2,000-mile journey from Chicago to California as legendary star Robert Taylor leads 200 women on an adventure that most men feared to face. In the past quarter century, MGM Studios has sent famous players to the far corners of the earth to bring you new, strange, and extraordinary thrills to darkest Africa, to mystic Asia, to the frozen Arctic, and to the tropical South Seas. Now, for the first time, MGM brings you an unexplored, savage wilderness never before photographed right in the continental United States. This is the hitherto untold story of those valiant pioneer women who defied perilous obstacles because they were lured by the promise of love at the end of the trail. Women. Good women. Wives for the men. With kids and diapers and the smell of cooking coming out of the chimney. What's that got to do with me? Men want wives and they put up the money to get them. They're as sick of this as I am. Absolute gambler. Uh, you know. Yeah, I know, and I like it. Okay, Buck. But you and I are going to Chicago. I'll recruit the women, and you'll guide them across the country. 2,000 miles of trail, and you know every inch of it. You brought wagon trains to Oregon, Sacramento, Santa Fe. You're the man to bring the women here to my valley. There's only two things in this world that scares me, and a good woman's both. Take a load of good women across hell, not me. How many good women do you figure on bringing? Yeah, there are a hundred men signed up for why. Better recruit 150 of them then. If we're lucky, we'll only lose one out of three. Initially, 15 men act as guides. This kind of fun will rip a train wide open. I've seen it happen. On most trains, the law against bundling is 30 lashes. On my train, it's a bullet. So use your heads. Stop your pleasuring and stay alive. But when one of the men disobeys the order of tough, experienced scout Robert Taylor not to fraternize with the ladies, Taylor shoots him, causing the others to desert. She's not dead. Nothing's happened to her that didn't happen to her before. All I did was rough her up a little. I told her not to make a fuss, she wouldn't listen. You remember what I told you I was going to do. You're going to give me a chance to draw, aren't you? Instead of turning back, the determined women insist on going on, learning to ride, shoot, and drive mules. Then on! Then on! You see what you started? It wasn't her fault. It could have happened... What do you mean it wasn't her fault? Who fired that gun? Roy was out of his mind to sign you on, you and your partner. From now on, Dan, on, stick close to your wagon. Don't move away from it. Treacherous terrain, catastrophic storms, and... Deadly Indian ambushes lie ahead, but these tough ladies are filled with the American frontier spirit, and nothing will stop them. William A. Wellman's West with the Women remains one of my personal, all-time 
favorite Western movie classics. And it is available at the Warner Archive even as we speak. Stay tuned for more Dick's Picks. Coming up on DVD Classics Corner on the air very soon. And it's always a great joy playing host to my frequent guest, actor, author, producer, William Wellman Jr. And today is no exception as we go westward with the women. William Wellman Jr., welcome back to DVD Classics Corner on a very special occasion. You must have gotten really tired every time you're on my show for Wings, for a tribute to uh, John Wayne, uh, High and the Mighty, but every time you're on my show, I, I'm always saying, where is your dad's West with the women? Why isn't it out every single time? And finally, I just love this film. Finally, West with the Women is now available courtesy of the Warner Archive. Isn't it great? Oh, I'm so happy and so pleased. Uh, you know, it's, it was one of my father's personal favorite films. I'm glad to hear that. Cause he loved it, and he, he, it was a picture, even though it was a very tough uh, location um, outside of Kanab, Utah, in a place called Surprise. Prize Valley, and uh, Kanab wasn't exactly uh, a place where there's much nightlife. So I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was a rough, it was a rough shoot. But my father loved every moment of it. Uh, he he was a he was very close to Robert Taylor. He really liked Robert Taylor a lot. He loved all the women that were in it. You know, the the picture is really uh, a kind of a tribute to my father's. Um, his admiration for strong, independent women, for the women who sacrificed their lives uh, in this movie, in, in history, for a man they had never met and a way of life that they had never known. It, it's, it's just amazing to me. And th this is 200 women who go from Chicago to California, a 2,000-mile journey by wagon through sandstorms, Floods, Indians, uh, uh, prairie fires, stampeding cattle. I mean, you can name uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. And this is so beautifully directed by your dad. I noticed for the first time when I watched it last night, the night before actually, that there is no music during the film. And I'm a big, big buff as far as uh, the great film scores go, but in this particular film, the fact that there was no music except in the opening credits and, uh, and the end, uh, it, it, it somehow gave it a, a punchy documentary kind of, kind of element. Do you, do you agree? No, I do, and also uh, my father... Uh asked his cinematographer, uh, William Meller, to refrain from using filters in order to give the picture a more natural and, and parched appearance. Um, and it and looked and like nobody was wearing any, any heavy makeup. I know, they weren't. Really? Yeah. And the picture just looks like you feel like you're there with those people. Uh, exactly. Those women, you know? Now, were you ever... Uh, on the set during the filming or you know I I was on 23 of my father's uh, film sets and locations and I was not on this one because it was shot entirely uh, in uh, Surprise Valley and and um, I'm trying to think of where they did the uh, some of the uh, the town at the beginning was probably at MGM but um, I was not there um, I was at a dinner, because Frank Capra, the Capra's in the Wellman, we lived on the same street, and um, Frank Capra's the one that 
wrote the story. Yes, now that, that, that I wanted to bring up because the, the credit in the beginning, I, what does it say, original story by Frank uh -huh. Capra? Well, here's what happened, and, and I was at, at this dinner that I was talking about where Frank Capra was so elated at how well my father had made this picture. So what happened originally was Capra told my father that he had this story that he just loved and no one would let him make a Western. No studio would accept it. So he said to my father, but they'll let you do it. So at the time, my father was making films uh, at MGM, starting with Battleground, and he made about six or seven films there, one after another. And he went to Dory Sherry, who was running the studio, with this story, Pioneer Woman, and he sold it to Sherry and made this wonderful picture. Can you imagine a studio turning down Frank Capra because he wanted to make a Western? I mean, what, what the heck is that? <laughs> Well, yes, frankly, I can. There's just no way that West Where the Women would have turned out as well, I think, uh, with Frank Capra uh, instead of your dad. I well, no, I wouldn't pick Frank Capra or my father for West Where the Women either, but I think he would have made a fine film because he was a great filmmaker. Your dad actually was coming off a series of films with, with I think, tough locations. Uh, I think of Yellow Sky over at Fox, and across the wide, the unfortunate, across the wide Missouri at MGM. Uh, these were very, very tough locations. I think Battleground was probably mostly filmed at the studio. Almost entirely in a soundstage. Well, that <laughs> that's a whole other story, because that's that's even more remarkable. I have a feeling he may have preferred rugged locations, same as John Huston, to get away from the studio guys. <laughs> would, I, would I be right about that? Uh, you'd be right. <laughs> you'd be right. Well, my father left MGM really as a result of Across the Wide Missouri, what they had done to that. Because he was already on uh, Westward the Women, and they were still messing around with Across the Wide Missouri, and they so destroyed it that they they made such a hash of it that they had to, that Howard Keel, the great singing star of yeah. MGM, they had him narrate the whole picture because it got so confusing. Because they and it's funny because it was their story. They gave it to my father. They talked my father into doing it. He didn't want to do it. They talked him into doing it. So he 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 liked the idea that it was an offbeat western, and he always liked offbeat westerns. So he he told Sherry, well, you're going to have to take my whole family to Colorado for the location on MGM and, uh, you know, and other things. And Sherry paid him extra money. So he went and shot the film. And he liked the idea that he, he did like the story. Then when, when the executives looked at this film, they thought, well, you know, it's too offbeat. I don't <laughs> think the audience of the 1950s is going to go for it. We're going to have to try to make it more more, uh, you know, typical, and they started editing and doing things, and they just messed around it, like I said, to the point where they had to have somebody narrate the picture, because yeah. they didn't think anyone could understand it. And the, the running time was reduced from what must have been close to a two-hour film to 78 minutes. Clark Gable, really the biggest star at MGM, if not the biggest star everywhere at the time, had never made a film that short since since the early 30s when he was doing programmers. It, it, it's really amazing to me, but you know, MGM, during that Shari period, had a history of doing that. They did the same thing to John Huston on a film called The Red Badge of Courage, which runs a, just a little over an hour. And... I'm just amazed that your dad <laughs> st uh, was able to stay at MGM for as long as he did. Yeah, well, he he see he he got caught up in Dory Sherry told my father that he wanted to teach audiences, to educate audiences to certain types of films. And my father didn't like that. I he didn't want to make message pictures. But my father liked to make unusual pictures, and he was always looking for a different story. And the stories that, that Dory Sherry was offering 
were very unusual stories. Well, you know, the next voice you hear, you know, my man and I, these were very unusual stories, and my father liked that. But he got dragged down by this message business, and also politics reared its ugly head. And all the people that Dory Sherry you know, hung around with were the most liberal people in Hollywood. You know, Danny Kaye and Betty Garrett and uh, yeah. Cotton and all these people. And it isn't that they weren't nice people, but they were so into politics that my father didn't like politics. So, in fact, they had a big dinner party, Dory Sherry did one night, and my father was invited, and they had a number of, of uh, Democratic politicians, people that were um, in, in Adderley Stevenson's, uh, uh, his group, and Adderley Stevenson was running for president at the time, I think we're talking 1952, mm -hmm. and um, my father got so fed up with it and they were saying, well, Bill, who do you, who are you, are you with us on Adderley Stevenson? And my father got up and marched around the room, and my mother told the story, <laughs> shouting, MacArthur for president, MacArthur for president. <laughs> and he left the room, and uh, he never went back. And he, and he didn't sign, Sherry had offered him uh, uh, another uh, bunch of years uh, contract with more money, and my father didn't want to do it. Which turned out to be a good thing for my father, because what did he do? He found a story called Island in the Sky, and he went over to John Wayne, and he made pictures with John Wayne, including the High and the Mighty. So it wasn't a bad move for my father. <laughs> I'll tell you, Bill, you, you say that your dad did not particularly like message pictures. He directed, possibly, the greatest message movie ever made. The Oxbow incident. I know. So, uh, see, he didn't look and at what it. about those years at Warner's? Um, some of those films is—is is it Wild Boys of the Road? Uh huh. That's that's a message film. That it is. If you look at it that way, Heroes for Sale uh, at Warner's as, as well. Oh yes. But my father didn't look at it that way. He didn't start out with the idea that oh God, this is a message picture. See, for him, it was just a great story. That's all he looked at. You know, maybe um, that's maybe that's the secret of making a great a great message film is to make it as if it's not uh, yeah. a, a message film because because you look at Oxbow Incident, which is the strongest I think anti-lynching film ever made by <laughs> by leaps and bounds, and it has so many other things in it. That, by the way, would probably be a. a, a close to the top of my favorites of, of your dad's films. Yeah, it, it's near the top for me, too. Um, it's, uh, I keep watching it, but it's such a harsh film. Yeah. And I just, I feel so bad for those three innocent men. Right. Particularly Dana Andrews, who had a wife and kids, you know. It just gets me. And, of course, it, it, it's always amazing to me that my father even got the picture made. I mean, if you think of 1942 when my father was going around all the studios trying to get the picture made, and the studios, we're at war. We're, there are internment camps in yeah, the West. Yeah. There's race riots in, in the East. Um, every manner of, of, of thing going on that the studios didn't want. You know, the studios are looking for lighter fare. And then here comes the story of, of the hanging of three innocent men, <laughs> yeah. you know? And that they all turned him down except uh, Daryl Zanuck at Fox, and he finally talked him into it, and Zanuck said, well, the picture will never make a dime, but I want to have my name on it. And the picture didn't make any money when it first came out. It took time for it to catch on, but they couldn't, the Academy could not completely disclaim it because it was so great and so powerful, and the picture got an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. Not one other nomination in any other category. How can you have a Best Picture and not... <laughs> not well, <laughs> I know, uh, it seems impossible, but they just could not discount the picture completely. So it got a, it got a nomination. But, you know, my father had a lot of those things, you know. There were only three directors in the history of the business 
that were not nominated for a picture that won Best Picture. Yeah. And my father was the first one with wings. Yeah. Never got nominated for it. <laughs> Edmund Goulding in 1932 with Grand Hotel. Bruce Beresford in 1989, I believe, for Driving Miss Daisy. And that's the, those are the only three times that it happened. So yeah. anyway, that's yeah. my father. <laughs> yeah. And of course, in order to do the Oxbow incident, both your dad and Henry Fonder had to pay the price by <laughs> by doing some pretty crappy studio films af uh, after that. Henry Fonda had to do a film called In Penance, had to do a film called The Magnificent Dope. That was his next film after Oxbow Incident. And your, your dad had to do, which I have a feeling he did not enjoy, Buffalo Bill. No, he didn't. He didn't, but he had to do two pictures, sight unseen, but boy, he didn't want to make that. You know what amazes me about your dad's work uh, in, in films? In each film, for instance, in Oxbow Incident, he chooses one of the most surprising camera angles in that there's a scene where Henry Fonda is reading mm -hmm. the letter of Dana Andrews, who's just been hung. And the whole, during the whole scene, Fonda's face, as I remember, is covered by Harry Morgan's hat. Yeah. <laughs> now that is, why does it work? Nobody else would do that. And the same thing happens in getting back to <laughs> Westward the Women. There's a long, long take with Robert Taylor and John McIntyre. Important dialogue at the beginning of the film, and it's all photographed from the back s with the horse's rump <laughs> staring us well, in the face. No my father, director. Uh, my father loved to do that. He loved uh, those, those camera, uh, those unusual camera angles. Uh, he was so used to doing it during his early early time as a director when he was under term contract and he had to make whatever script they gave him and a lot of the scripts he felt were were not you know were like b picture material were not very strong and he would think of everything he could come up with to improve them and that would be camera angles he would add humor he would you know whatever he could do to try to make them more interesting but he never lost that interest in those unusual compositions and camera angles and they're in every picture. Getting back to Westward, the women, though, there, there was one thing, uh, there was an amazing um, situation here where with all the women, and first of all, you know, my father, when the, uh, there's a scene in the beginning of the picture where um, Robert Taylor tells the women as they're signing up how difficult this is going to be, and if they're smart, they'll turn around and walk right out of the right out of the building. It's a great scene. My father gave almost the same speech to those women when he was casting. We jump off from Independence. We cross the Big Blue River, the Little Blue, the Platte, the Sweetwater, South Pass over the Rockies, down to the Big Salt Lake, then the desert. It's a long, hard grind with no let-up. Rain, hail as big as eggs, Breakdowns, prairie fires, sand storms, dust storms, alkali water, no water. Cholera, Indians, drowning, stampedes, stupid accidents. You'll pass graves everywhere. Milestones along the way. One out of every three of you will be dead before you get to his California Valley. So if you're smart, you'll leave by that door. My best advice, follow it, now. And he told them the same thing. He said, look, there's going to be no prima donnas in this picture. This is going to be a rough film to do. And I'm going to put you through two weeks training. So if you're smart, you'll turn around and you'll walk right out of here. <laughs> and, and what he did was um, they went through a two-week training course. They were taught to ride, shoot, bullwhip, you know, 
man horses, covered wagons, uh, and when they started shooting the film, he made Polly Burson, who was one of the best female stunt riders in the business. She had doubled uh, Shirley Temple, Esther Williams, Jane Russell, Maureen O'Hara, Lana Turner, Marilyn Monroe, and she was the she became the very first uh, female stunt coordinator. It was the first time that position was filled by I, a woman. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, she was fabulous. To keep everything authentic, the girls lived exactly like the pioneer women they'll portray, wearing the same clothes day after day. And instead of a suntan, they sported blisters and windburns. The only shade available was on the ground, under the covered wagons. And so it went for eight long weeks. Hundreds of hard-working people in the middle of nowhere, providing exciting entertainment for people all over the world. The spirit and enthusiasm of this company is something I'll never forget. The time and effort they put into this picture, the hardships they endured were worth it, I'm sure. They challenged the wilderness and won. Identification. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is exclusively produced and released by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc. All rights reserved. The women, the stunt riders, my father hired every woman, every female stunt writer, stunt person in the business. Every one of them that, that was that had done anything. The athletic horse women, um, people that had doubled Dale. You know, Polly had had doubled Dale Evans too. Betty Hutton, Sophia Loren, Barbara Stanwyck, Doris Day. <laughs> wow! I mean, just, there's no end to how good these women were, and the, the reputation was that. Many of those women were better riders than, than the men who were cowboy stars at the time. I well, mean, those women were fantastic. Uh, well, one thing baffles me, because I had heard during some of the really dangerous scenes, like uh, uh, the women uh, trying to uh, ride the wagons down that steep, steep, dangerous incline, I had heard that some of the the women on long shots were actually men with wigs. Is that true or not yes, true? Yes, that's true. Frank McGrath, uh, he was a, a famous stuntman, and uh, he, because he was not, he was short, he used to double women a lot. And, uh, but that's true. But there were only a few uh, men, stuntmen, on the picture. And uh, there were many women stuntmen. Now, what about Denise Darcel, who has the biggest role, and by the way, had a very good role, her, I think her first, one of, one of her first in your dad's Battleground, which was made about a year or two before. Did she do her own writing, or...? or? I, I don't think she did much writing. But she was, you know, she was somebody who would do whatever my father wanted in terms of stunts. She would, she's ready to do anything. Really? But he, he protected her as he would any other uh, of the actresses uh, in terms of having a double for them. Uh, and I don't think she did much of her own writing. She did some. Now, a few years ago, Chad Everett told me that in his opinion, and he worked with, with all of them, the three best riders, horseback riders, in, in movies were... Glenn Ford, Joel McRae, and Robert Taylor. And I have to say, from, from the very first shot of Taylor in West with the Women, 
his writing is such that it, it it's almost like Fred Astaire <laughs> dancing. Yeah. Ha, yeah. Have you noticed that? I mean, he do, and there are no doubles because I I froze frame. Maybe there were a few, but I froze frame some of Taylor's writing. That's him. No, he was an excellent writer. And don't forget Randolph Scott in your list. Oh, of course. Of great uh, actors who were great writers. Of course. But, uh, oh, and that that reminds me of something else. Uh, uh, the Robert Taylor is writing a very famous horse in the movie. Steel was the name of the horse. And Steel was the number one... Uh, horse in the 1940s and 50s and every and every I mean some of the people that sat on that horse were were the people that you named the, the Joel McCrae's and the Randolph Scott's and uh, Clark Gable and those people and everyone tried to buy this horse because it was the horse was so wonderful I mean it looked so great I mean it had that beautiful white face and it had white stockings and it was just a beautiful horse and it was so it would do you know the horse would do anything it was a great horse to ride and everyone tried to buy it and the fellow who owned the horse his name was fat jones believe it or not that was his name he would never sell the horse and the horse uh, lasted through even robert mitchum uh, rode that horse in um, track of the cat now, I mean, everyone and everyone loved that horse, and Robert Taylor wanted to buy that horse too. <laughs> now, that wouldn't be the same horse that Jimmy Stewart rode in Winchester '73, because he t uh, told uh, uh, essentially the same story that he tried to buy the horse in Winchester '73, and I, I think it is the same. Horse. Really? Yeah. And and then uh, uh, Stewart ended up uh, doing all of his westerns with that that particular horse and he that's spoke it, about the, the horse was he he said did everything on literally on cue yes that's steel <laughs> that's amazing I had heard that Robert Taylor absolutely loved doing westerns yes well you know for years he was such a pretty boy and he was you know his reputation he was the handsomest actor in the business and all this kind of thing and he it, it graded on him on him a little bit and he looked for these roles he wanted to get these roles where he could be rugged and um, the first time he did a western I mean he, he said I love this and he also as you as we've just been talking he's a great horseman and uh, he loved westerns obviously the relationship between your dad and Robert Taylor was a very positive one. How, how do they like working together on, in particular, on West with the women? Well, they loved it, and they, they both were very proficient pool players. And there was not anything to do in Kanab, Utah at night after shooting, and they would play pool. Robert Taylor had his airplane on the location and his pilot. And he would fly every day from Kanab to the Surprise Valley location. And my father would go with him most of the time. Taylor was an uh, experienced pilot. Didn't, didn't he do his own flying? Well, my, my father, he wrote about this, and he said that he had his own pilot. Now, maybe, maybe this was early in his flying career, you know what I mean? Maybe he had a pilot, and then later he didn't. Well, he was. I, a, I don't know. Taylor was a flight instructor during World War II. Well, I, I don't know. You know, well, I think I figured it out. I, if I were the studio, I don't know whether I'd, <laughs> I'd want my star uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. piloting a plane. Well, there you go. A private plane. Yeah. I mean, I, I bet that's true. What do you think were the biggest challenges? that your dad had as far as West with the Women is concerned. And, and by the way, this is one film that obviously the studio did not toy with or, or cut because no. the, the film is close to two hours. No. And it feels short to me because I want, <laughs> I want it to go on and on. What do you think were the greatest challenges? I think the idea, the challenges were 
uh, they had all sorts of weather problems, uh, and they wanted to shoot in the weather, you know, no matter how bad it got, because it would, that's the way it was, you know, in the, in the 1800s when they actually had these mail order brides and they took them from, from the east coast to the west coast and they went through every kind of bad weather and uh, I think it's just a, a, you know, it was just a rugged location with the covered wagons and all the horses and all of the stuff that they had to uh, control. Um, I know, it's, a, it's an epic Western. I heard your dad said at one point that he thought Robert Taylor was the handsomest man he'd ever seen. Yeah, he did say that. And he and I, you know, it's pretty hard to find someone that you think is more handsome than Robert Taylor. <laughs> it sure is. You know, even if you pick him when he first started and he looked so beautiful. Yeah. Handsome and be- you know, and then later when he as he got a little older and he played some more of the rugged parts and he still looked just absolutely great. It's amazing for an actor to make that kind of a transition because I had heard that there was a point in 1939 where people were making fun of him, where men would not go to see a Robert Taylor film because the women were so nuts about him. Uh, There was one film uh, he did with Hedy Lamarr and the critics said, well, it's not much of a film, but you know, which way do you look? Do you look at (laughs) Robert Taylor or Hedy Lamarr, (laughs) who is prettier? And, yep. and this transition he made. Well, that bothered him. It must it, have. It did bother him, and, and uh, he loved it when he got into Westerns. I mean, that, that's probably one of the reasons he started doing Westerns is because uh, he wanted to get away from that. Now, did you ever personally meet Robert Taylor? Oh, yes. Well, because when they were riding motorcycles together, I, I met him. But, of course, I was a little kid then, but then... Later on, um, my father used to play golf with Robert Taylor, and I played golf with Robert Taylor on a number of occasions. And my father used to have a birthday party. He was born on leap year, so he would have a big party every four years, and Robert Taylor was one of the people that he invited. So I did get to meet him, and I found him to be, you know, really a great guy. And, And you go out and play golf with him, and he had no attitude or anything. He was a real down-to-earth person. So no star complex? No, No, none of that. Absolutely none of that. Really? And uh, I I believe you must have also met uh, Clark Gable during uh, Across the Wide Missouri. Well, that was a picture that I was on the the whole run of the picture. And I used to go fishing with Clark Gable. Because on, on Across the Wide Missouri, my father got told the production manager and unit manager to make sure that they hire a crew that likes to fish. And with every interview with the actors, he said, do you like to fish because we're going to be fishing. Huh. And he built, my father had every location built on a body of water, a lake, a river, you know. And at the end of the day, my father loved to quit to wrap early, he'd wrap at five o'clock, and out would come the, the fishing poles, and everybody would fish. And uh, and Clark Gable was a great fisherman, and um, and well, I used to fish well, with them all. And one day Gable says to me, he says, "Bill, I've got a, I found a special little lake, and I don't think anyone's found it. If you want to go down? It's a little bit of a hike." And I said, "Sure." So I went with Clark Gable to this lake. And we caught a whole bunch of fish. They were cutthroat trout. There's all different kinds of trout. I don't know how much you know about not trout, much. They're, these the cutthroats are not they're not as big as some of the, like rainbows and eastern brook and some of the other types. But they they're a real fighting fish, and we had a heck of a good time catching them. And also uh, on Sundays, the day off, my father had a baseball team. They were called Wellman's Wild Men, <laughs> and they had jerseys that said Wellman's Wild Men on it. And Gable played left field, and I was playing right field. <laughs> and Gable was really good. In fact, we were play- they would play the local town teams, and they used to do this on other pictures. It wasn't just across the wide Missouri. 
but on Cross the Wide Missouri, we were we were shooting in Durango, and uh, they challenged a, a town, a local team uh, that had, you know, they were not professionals, but they used to play. They had a league and everything, and so my father put together his company, and we played them, and um, we were behind by two runs in the last inning and we were and Gable had hit a home run with with a man on base and those were the two runs that we had and he came to bat and I know it was I was afraid I was going to have to come up we had two on two men on and two outs and I didn't want to make the last out of the game I was 13 years old and um, Gable was up before me and I thought, oh, well, we're going to win the game now. And he struck out. Ooh. And I remember being absolutely mortified. How could Casey strike out? <laughs> <laughs> Clark Cable struck out. But then the next week he won the fishing contest. So, I mean, every week they had a, some sort of a contest. And that's what they did in those days. Were there any significant differences between... Clark Gable and Robert Taylor, or similarities th that you found since you got to know both of them? Yes. They were both very much outdoorsmen. They were hunters. They were, you know, I don't know if, if Robert Taylor was a fisherman, but I know he was a hunter. Mm -hmm. And they loved outdoor activities. I mean, hey, uh, Taylor was a pilot, he said. And, uh, Gable was as much an outdoorsman as you can be. Yeah. Um, and they both had, there was never any attitude with either of them. They were just guys you could just, you could sit down and have a beer with. Even Clark Gable. Even Clark Gable. Huh. Now, again, I played golf with Clark Gable as well after that. And um, his health was not very good at that time. I mean, he could only play nine holes. And he was drinking too much. Yeah, I heard that wasn't uh, pleasant but I when I when I how, how so how so was he actually drunk during the uh no but he was just drinking he was drinking my he was drinking um, um, martinis at lunch and wow his his he you know he just wasn't he wasn't very strong anymore he had my father said that it was all, all because of Carol Lombard. And that's, this was my father's remark, because Gable was so in love with Carol Lombard that when she was killed in, in that uh, air, air accident, he never really... Recovered. Recovered from that. And he married twice after it, and they all looked like Carol Lombard. Um, Lady Sylvia Ashley was his wife during across the wide Missouri, and she was blonde, and you know she had a resemblance to Carol Lombard, and then Case Freckles was also blonde and had a, a certain look, but that was a very sad thing. And then and then the problem with his son, you know, it just it gnawed at him, and I think it. it the, uh, Gable had a, had a son. Um, I'm trying to remember the no, story. No, no. Uh, Gable did not have a son. In fact, his the first fact that he son was was actually born uh, after he died. Yeah, right. That's what I mean. Yeah. He never had one in his, he never had a, a son in, or a child in his lifetime. Oh, yes, he did. He had, sorry to, to contradict you, no, but... No, no, I'm trying to remember. Well, during... Huh, during your dad's call of the wild... I had heard that Gable well, okay. and Wellman did not get on well at all, uh, at all, because okay, Gable well was you're talking about. But I don't even. I'm not even counting uh, Judy Lewis. Oh, oh. Uh, in this, because Loretta Young Gable really didn't know about it, and when he did know about it, Loretta did, wanted to kept tried to kept him kept him away from her. I know. So I mean that was. Um, but what isn't there? Was there another child? I'm trying no, to remember. not to my knowledge. I can't remember the story. No, I'm sorry. no, <laughs> that's all right. Well, the bottom line is that all good things happen if you <laughs> wish for them. 
uh, uh, long enough. And again, as you know, West with the Women is one of my favorite films. I would put it at the top two, for me, the top two or three favorite Wellman films. Well, I'm there too. Oh, you would put it also at the top? In the te- it would be in the top five of my favorite films of my father. To me, it's just a, just a great, great film, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Bill, you are at the very top of my list as a favorite, favorite guest. The only negative about our talks together is, uh, is they have to come to an end. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, that's v- very, very difficult for me. I'll have to take a swig of something to... <laughs> well, listen, I, s- I send it all back to you, the same thing. I mean, <laughs> I, I very much enjoy talking with you, um, and I hope that, you know, when you come out to Los Angeles, uh, you know, you'll, you'll give me a call, and we'll get together, and we'll chat on into the night. Well, you'll be the first, uh, <laughs> the first call I make. Well, that's my show for today. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is conceived, written, produced, and directed by me, Double D. And if you'd like to hear some of my older, vintage shows, please go to www.dvdclassicscorner.net, where in addition to the broadcasts, you'll find hundreds of my print reviews of classic DVD releases. So, until next week... Keep well, keep happy, and... Keep listening.